talent manager, public speaker, and PR strategist. And I know you're wanting one person, all of this. Even I was shocked as well. I've known her a little while, but I didn't know that she was a woman of so many talents and skills. And of course, she has vast work experience in different industries. So she is definitely no stranger to challenges and hard work. And she's also the co-founder of Life Fountain Orphanage, Orphanage Home, which is why we are here today to talk to her. And guess what? At the Life Fountain Orphanage Home, she is a mother to the 24 children at the home. Yes, I said 24 children. You heard me right. Ladies and gentlemen, Lagos, please welcome Victoria Unkong. Did I get that right? Unkong. Very well. Surprisingly, <laughs> most people don't get it. <laughs> Good morning, Kelly. Good morning. Kelly is already more of a sister to me. So glad to be here with <laughs> I you. I know, right? I know we should have done this earlier. Yeah. We should have done it earlier. But I know the December period was a busy one for you. So I didn't want to stress you too much back then. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, it's great to have you here. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, you need to break down all of these many hats that you're wearing. Give us a brief history on how you ventured into some of these things. <laughs> <laughs> um okay where do i start from okay quickly i i was told i'll be a lawyer from like when i was like five years old because the entire family thought i talked a lot and then my dad was a lawyer so he thought i would be i'll take after him one thing led to another and i got into the university to study foreign languages and translation studies so major french and spanish um that was how it started it was like real problems in my family my dad felt how can this child be so crazy but i grew to love it <laughs> yeah i grew to love it and um thankfully i graduated as the best from my department at the time that threw me straight into um choral africa music awards i'm trying to oh. just abridge and be quick yeah okay. at the time Kura was looking for a bilingual phone operator not even anything deep mm. and i got the oh, after interviews blah, blah blah i got the job rookie then very young but somehow it got interesting you know the niger hustle i was working with a lot of francophones and foreigners but you now i went there with my eyes on the go <laughs> <laughs> so besides just taking calls and speaking french to people and spanish to people i made sure i let them see that i had the capacity to do a bit more you know i was a lot more involved and before you know I was promoted to the personal assistant to the core president and then one day he called me and said, you know, a PA is not a pro position. What exactly do you want to do with your life? Mm. We spoke at length and he says, okay, I see you, um, you're a people's person, the way you manage my friends and da da da. So let's speak in, in charge of talent management for Cora. It was like, wow, for me, it was a big hat. So that's how I started dealing with all the problems that come with artists. <laughs> and trust me, it was a lot then. Cora was... At each of our Cora events, we had minimum of like 2,000 artists from different countries. Yeah, Cora was a pretty big deal, I remember it. So I would speak to them on phone, when they get on ground finally, if there's any issues, you know how it goes. Ego issues, tantrums, whatever. Yeah. Everyone knew if you call on me, there's just the way I had that calmness and smile and how to wrap their heads up to calm people down. <laughs> so, I mean, from there, it just kept pushing. Then Cora still sent me for the training. Um for event production it was more like the longer i stayed the more the organization felt like i could do a bit better or a lot more than what i was doing oh, so good. they sent me for event production training with gear house of africa that really changed my life it was so much magic at once when i went to study with gear house and after that i thought my first love was event production mm. but when i left Kora. Um, relocated back home to Nigeria. I still had a lot of artists reaching out to me from different countries. Uh, help me hook up this collaboration. Help me do this. What do you think? Mm. And at some point, I'm like, dude, I'm doing this thing for free. <laughs> so why not make it official and make some yes. money out of it? So that was how I now officially, because I had my small team then. That's how I now officially put together the talent management part. I was already being contacted by different organizations for events production because they knew me for that with Cora mm -hmm. and Gear House. When I left Cora, literally made me the oh god, I was so small memories. Made me <laughs> like the uh, rep around the West African coast, so it was wow. easy. It was like a soft landing for me because when mm -hmm. they had projects around Nigeria, Ghana, I had to do the local what do you call it corresponding for them, mm -hmm. like your fixer. That's what my company was doing. So we met that with talent management, and that's pretty much how it started. But then it kept expanding. Um, it, it was more like everything was tied to the order because 
for a few of the artists. Do you remember Oloyoko then? Infinity, the guys that are yes, Oloyoko, yes, yes, I remember. I used to manage them. Wow. <laughs> so with them, I realized we had some things for image. The song was big, but like the brand wasn't, the, the Infinity brand wasn't known. In mm. fact, that's how I started diving, delving into talent management. Like, what do we need to do for the name to be at par with mm. the brand and all that? But if you look at the so many things you mentioned, most of them tie together. Into each other. Yes. Yeah, that's, so if I have an event I'm producing, it's easy for me to hook up my artist in there. You know, then they will need PR for the event anyway. So I can give you a plan to publicize. <laughs> you want area is not paying, guys. The second one is paying. So which which one is like your favorite job out of all of these? Oh, it's out. This part is not a job, but being a mother, like the the orphanage part, which I haven't mentioned. For me, it's the it's the one thing that gives life a meaning and gives me a lot of fulfillment so that's the biggest that's the part i would never compromise so if i have a job of a hundred million to do for events or with an artist or whatever and i have a quick call at the orphanage i'm sorry i'm going to the orphanage i'm going to my children there's there's no rethinking about this i'm going to my children because that's okay so um, I had a midlife tragedy sort of. I lost my sister to violent oh, marriage. Wow. wow. Yes. And that literally almost crashed my life and sanity. Mm. And so the healing process actually came from the home. Mm. So I owe a lot. I feel like I'm I'm privileged to have these kids in my life because it's one thing that if I go out and I have a bad day or whatever, mm. once I walk through that door into the orphanage, I forget all my problems. I forget that I'm broke. I forget what, because there's so much love in it. You need to see me and my kids. I'm like a small Michael Jackson there. Everybody's mommy, mommy, mommy. So it's just a different vibe and fulfillment. I won't trade for anything. Okay, so we'll get more into that. But um, let's let's kick off with this. How many f- foundations are you a part of? Because your bio mentioned, I think, two or three foundations. How many foundations yes. are you officially a part of? Um, as a trustee, okay. Jagger Paul Foundation and Life Fountain Orphanage Home. Okay. Those are two. I do support for a few other. There's a widow organization and things like that. But the ones that I'm fully a part of and running, so to speak, is mm. the Life Fountain of Nature Home and the Get Paul Foundation. Okay, but which one is your main focus? I think the both of them are tied, but Life Fountain, the orphanage is, is a daily thing. It's something that, mm. you know, there are real lives there, you know, every yeah. day the kids are going to school, a child is sick, whatever, so that you can't even put it by the side. Then for the foundation, the, the orphanage is actually under the foundation. Oh, okay. It's an hospital of the foundation, but for the foundation, we have like quarterly projects, Oh. Um, slum invasion where we go to slums uh, i can explain shit on that later the widows outreach so there's different things we do under the foundation but the orphanage is there yeah. in your face every day with real issues to handle and you know to keep going hmm. so what got you started on philanthropy work is was it just the tragedy that you faced no far from it um from when i was very young from uh, as a child hmm. you know everyone knew that what made me happy was making others happy, even when I had to pretend to inconvenience myself. So yeah. I'll say to my siblings, no, no, I'm not hungry because I feel like you need more food so you can have mine. This kind of... Remember one day my dad dropped me off in school in just one, and after dropping me off, he screamed my name when I said, make sure you don't give out your pocket money and your <laughs> snacks to your sister today. <laughs> That's how bad it was. So uh, when I grew to like age 11, mm. I had were more of girls and I had all my sisters in the choir and doing things you know singing whenever they are rehearsing at home and I come to put my voice they will shut me up because I don't particularly have a good singing voice (laughs) (laughs) so I started like trying to see what I could do for God as well Mm. you know I was too young for them to allow me go for all the a lot of other things choir my parents would have allowed me because my sisters were going but my voice obviously didn't give me a chance so it was easy for me to find out you know after praying that what gave me fulfillment was mm. helping other people find joy, you know, make sense out of their lives. And then my mom, she was a school principal then, she would feed all the coppers. There was just this thing about her making us understand that nobody should go hungry, no child mm. deserves to be on the street. It's sort of stuck. So mm. from like age 13, I was already planning and praying that God would help me to... What I wanted to do was an open kitchen where... Mm people can come and they are assured of two square meals in a day if yeah. they don't need to live under me so i had that plan and i planned to kick off at 25 then my sister died you know life changed a bit i left work when i was working i actually was already saving towards my foundation like okay. most of my funds but when my sister died like things sort of became unclear to me and mm. um it was a tough time 
so i think the way i was able to connect with the fact that because she she left two children behind and, wow. and i was like the mommy to those two kids i'm the last child of my family but everybody knows that if anyone has a new baby at home and the omugori i'm the one who goes to babysit and it was more like i was more skilled almost than my mom in those things so i was so close to her babies i'm the one mm. who nursed them you know i'll find time from work come once any of my siblings as a baby i actually take time off from work to go and care for the child so when she died and then the husband took off for the kids it was so much for me to handle sorry he what he took off with the kids he's not in her funeral sorry for another day i don't want to break down but so i, I sort of channeled the love and the energy into caring for other children so yeah. it still started at 25 funny enough god knows how to make things happen but then it wasn't an open kitchen anymore it was now an orphanage and I found the chairman of Japol who was very impressed. I was consulting for Japol at the time, but he knew I was doing a lot of activities for other orphanages because I'll go every weekend, visit homes, volunteer there. I was trying mm. to learn for my own project okay. and I was using it to heal because anytime I'm less busy at the time, I'll be crying 10 hours in a day and imagining I was going to see my sister. You know all of those things, the mm. uh, depression. But so he found out and he said he wanted to accompany me and that's how Life Fountain was birthed, sort of. Wow. Did you have any challenges when you started off? Woo, I'm not even going to pretend. <laughs> <laughs> that woo, was enough explanation. Rock load. <laughs> there were times I asked myself that, should you say you're not a hear word? That's how do you think you could do this? <laughs> literally i can't like no a lot a lot happened Kel, trust me like from each time you thought this was the worst you know some other things come at you i remember literally once i packed and i'm like okay so this project so long i'm leaving i'll find someone to fit in for me here you know um i think the worst of it was when i lost a child at the home um oh it was a special child he had cerebral palsy oh my home doesn't take special children but no other home was accepting him from the government at that time and i thought okay this is still a child so i took him in without the skills and we started trying to do therapy the government promised to take him away two weeks like help us keep him for two weeks to we'll find placement for him mm. i never found placement one year went by one and a half year and i was now feeling mean for always going to remind them like come and take this child away so i started trying to find how to manage him that mm. the therapy uh, it was complex he died in a very funny way like he died almost in my arms what i didn't because i was rushing him to the hospital i lagos traffic i packed mm. I, I was in my house coat my nighty was flying they're very dramatic so i didn't know he had even passed but i but when i got to the hospital the doctor realized they didn't want to tell me first because they said the way they saw me so they asked me to wait outside that i trying to recite him then eventually they broke the news i couldn't i'm like this project was to give life not to take life i'm mm. not doing it again you wow know, i'm not Are you doing serious? yeah i wasn't i was ready to leave like to move on and if not for the other kids you know when you want to leave because of one and then then i had like 30 children then there are like 29 others looking at you and moming you and was there's been challenges there's been even financial i won't forget the day i i was literally left with like three thousand naira in my account mm -hmm. and i had like seven children on admission in the hospital because i use a private hospital it was the okay I'm on air, I won't say some things, but I had to start in a private hospital for the kids after a few experiences. And there was this one time, so many sick children at the same time. Mm. I left, I drove out of the home that day, going back to my own house then, because I needed space to think and understand. I'm share like Gongo. And the chairman, my partner, was out of the country, and I don't always want to go bothering him, you know. So I go home that day, I'm like, God, I was quarreling God. Like, but these are your children now. Mm -hmm. That if you allow it to be so stressful for me, God, me, I'll be low. Mm. Like, how can things be so tough? Literally, I was quarreling God. But like they say, he always comes true. Funny testimony. I got a call that same night around midnight. I got a project from an old partner from outside the country. Long long story short, I had 3K that night. By the next morning, I had like $40,000 in my account. So it's one thing I've learned, <laughs> God always pulls through. Yes, he does. Because you know, they are his children. He understands yes. they are not mine. Yes. So, so do you actually like live in the orphanage home? Partly. With the, with the children? Partly. I have like my room. I have, I have my space within. So yeah. would I say my life is divided 60-40 when I'm in Lagos? Would I say 60-40? Let me say 80-20. When I'm in Lagos, 80% of my time is spent with the children. Yeah, yeah. I moved my office into the orphanage premises because... 
I realized with how Lagos is, my office was in, in um, Lekki Phase 1, the office is not Molly. But by the time you had work, before you get back to the home, yeah, I wasn't sure. Yeah, that. so and there's an emergency, it's gonna be hard for you to. And the caregivers have more time to, sorry to sound this way, to treat your children the way they want when you're very upset. Mm. So I had to, so like stuff happened and I just I, moved I always in. wonder about that orphanages that house children, like how difficult is it picking adequate caregivers who actually care for these children and not just doing it because you're paying them Tough. or because you know whatever it is that they might be getting Tough. Tough because um, even when you're interviewing everyone says oh I love children, I have passion for children, yes because they want a job then you delve in and then you realize that it's just a job to them and children are a handful oh, everybody yeah. knows that mm -hmm. you have to you can correct children but you can't be punishing like so mm. I've, I've gone through those stages several there was a time i had to send all six caregivers plus me trying away i was left with 17 children alone to handle because i traveled to south africa and came back and my children were like skeletons it was a bad but i couldn't oh, i sent everybody please. away they were so scared literally when you enter they shiver i'm like what have they what kind of tormenting has gone on in the lives of these children neighbors around the orphanage called me and were telling i sent away everybody i'm like i rather manage 17 kids alone it's that bad but luckily after a while with prayers sorry i talk about prayers often no 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 it's still free <laughs> with prayers god actually leads you to the right people because i feel right now well this is my ninth to tenth year so maybe time also helps but right now i have people i'm comfortable with they are not perfect they love the fact that they are paid i've been able to find the balance to make sure that okay eat what you want so as you're cooking for the children i never say why are you eating so much eat what you want be comfortable little pecs which makes them happy, but then they realize that our joy, my joy with them, is tied to how happy my children are, sort of, and they're doing well. Mm -hmm. so. so how do you get the, the children? Is it that the government send them to you, or, or is it hospitals, or do you go out looking for, like, how do you get the children to care um, for? For us, it's strictly through the government. Um, mm -hmm. From experience, I've read stories about baby-making factories and blah, 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 to mm -hmm. keep away from trouble. We are registered with the government officially okay and mm -hmm. then when there's a child to help they call us to either go and rescue or they rescue the child to the ministry of uh, youth and social development allows and then they call mm -hmm. us to pick from there so every child comes with a letter from the government then we process a cut extract for the child like literally there has to be documentation it limits somehow how much you can help but what mm -hmm. i do is that i'll rather refer you to the ministry to pass through the procedure than just mm. take a child off the street because if there's so much involved you know it's life right yes, mm -hmm. so yes. there's so much involved even the one you get officially if something goes wrong I, like when my child died i went through a very long and hectic process the one that I, irrespective of the fact that I was a special child and blah 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 you still go through a process to defend that um you did all you, you could did all you could yes so you don't want to take a child without documentation you know it could be very complicated so we take strictly through the government now if i have someone in their need that i know i could call the ministry to say please go check or go help out you know and then if they now take the child and refer to my home fine if they refer to another home also fine do you have a limit on the number of kids that you can currently house yes i've limited it to 13 now because i the vision for my home Mm. is to give children as close as possible to what they will get in a normal family setting mm. so if i have too much you know it will be impossible to give them it's that i i don't want to ever 25 actually but when it gets to 30 i lock the door totally so that the kids there can have enough love attention be well cared for within because um unfortunately it's nine years but i can't say there's any organization internationally pumping money in and stuff mm. we're doing what we can between the other trustee and myself for these children wholly between us so um i have to choose my battles wisely and something i forgot to mention when i was about nine from school went to visit an orphanage home and there was a baby in a court maybe a two weeks old baby that i picked up mm. and when he held on to me and you know one of the caregivers said no no, no drop him down i said why he said if you get him used to being carried you know when you go who will carry him that touched me seriously because i had a nephew at home that all of us used to struggle for who to, to carry, carry yeah. so i'm like this baby does it felt weird so when i when i did my home 
my focus was to ensure that the children get enough love who needs mm. to be cuddled needs to be cuddled it's not yeah. that hard you know who they should be <laughs> so i don't want too many i want to be able to give in fact with my kids it's it's a ball i take them in pairs of five to my house we go do weekend sleepovers you know that's the time i have time to one-on-one -on -one with you teach yeah. you you're a girl tell you those girl things teach you how to cook if there are too many kids you can't really and there's so much love if you visit the home you will see the bond between the kids you'd actually think they are blood related everyone looks after each other there's so much love in the mating and i think it's because i've been able to keep it small and you know connected mm. How, at what age do you um accept kids from zero to seven ideally um because I believe a child in Lagos who's seven, eight years old is already set in their ways, mm. already street wise, and I don't have what it takes <laughs> to reshape them. So anything under seven years is welcome, you know, because I feel we can still mold you at that age and reform you a bit. Then at what age, like what, what is the process? You keep them there with you. At what age do they, do they leave or do you send them off? Or? Our vision <laughs> is to support them till they are independent. So I currently have, <coughs> sorry, dear, I currently have like a 15 years old with me, my oldest daughter. Mm -hmm. um, we will train them through secondary, train them through university. What I also do is that once you're above 10, you begin to learn a skill as well, besides mm -hmm. going to school. Oh yes, yeah, so, because we know we are this country is headed. So you learn a skill. So somehow we support you till you're independent. So if by 18 you have graduated and you're saving and you're earning something, well, I've done our bits for you. What we expect is that you can also look out for others in the society or if you're coming back home, you're also coming to look after your younger ones and things like that. But we don't... Because, like I said, what, our, what we have in mind is a family. Yeah. I mean, some get adopted. So some okay. get adopted, they find okay. new families and all of that. But there are some who the circumstances surrounding their coming to the home has made it um, unlikely that they will get adopted so they've been there for a while. Those ones... We would support them till they are independent through university education and all of it. Mm. I've even I've thrown away the actual questions I asked for you because the conversation <laughs> is so enlightening. Like you're the Sorry. first guest I have <laughs> who actually runs, you know, a day to day home because other yeah. guests do like the you know events here and there and catering okay. to widows and all of that. So this is actually quite fascinating. So seeing that you're registered under the government and all of that, shouldn't the government be um, allocating some sort of budget? Is, is it what they do or is it what they say they do or is it just not in the picture at all so our relationship with the government is more regulatory oh, okay. um, so okay. they check to be sure that um, this put processes in place to ensure that these kids are not being trafficked so mm. you don't hide under the guise of a home and you're doing child trafficking or whatever okay. you know, that's more of what they do so it's like regulatory support as well that's how we have social workers um, attached to us from the government that see to the court processes with us if a child is getting mm -hmm. adopted and all of that they assist although we also have in-house social workers and, and I'm a social worker myself as for financing to be very strict the government doesn't finance okay um once in a while they support i've, I've received rice a couple of times or gifts oh, once okay. in a while for maybe the first lady or something like that but now it's not interesting quite quite interesting uh, <laughs> wow <laughs> in fact so all your staff is all your staff paid or do you have volunteer staff who comes in from time to time to help at the moment all of them are paid um in the past i had a few friends who come to volunteer over weekends and the rest but like those were my friends mm. um but since covid we've kept it closely oh, knit within best. our paid staff so we've never really been reliant on volunteers from my experience in the past we've never really been reliant it's just been mostly staff that we pay but then if i have close friends or a sister on a holiday they come in they fit in and all of that yeah but after covid i really try to look into volunteering a bit more like having a bit more organized volunteering mm. Mm. um what is your biggest recurring challenge like every year the biggest challenge that you face oh um which do i go to okay so i mentioned my kids are all in school and it's a private school so <laughs> oh my days, man. <laughs> all of them all in of private school all of them well there's one that's not in school she's 
she doesn't hear she's deaf and dumb she came to me at like mm. seven months and i realized she couldn't talk she couldn't work blah, blah, blah. Mm. therapy now she works luckily and mm. we recently now started therapy for hearing but all of those things are so financial intensive that mm. at times you need to prioritize so there's it's it's think about a mother with two children mm. the way my home is set up think about a mother with two children think about a mother with 24 children so for every pair of shoes you're buying you're buying 24 pairs most likely mm -hmm. each day you're thinking about food so while you buy a carton of noodles for your two kids and it's like for two weeks my carton of noodles is daily because mm. they consume a carton daily that kind of thing so finance there's always need for money health care is a big deal because mm. um most of the children come in a bad health state Mm. and so what i do once i receive a child i just go straight to the hospital okay. so the pediatrician attends to them and either advises that oh this one you can take home or this one, this one needs monitoring uh, initially i'll take you to um, last suit for evaluation mm. um i had an experience and me it's like these are lives i don't like to gamble with lives yeah i had an experience with a baby who came in at about three months old with a sister of about five years and I put the, I took them to Lassoot and it was just, okay, they're fine, take them home. I took them home. I had a, an event that day. So after dropping them at home, before I even go into the home, I always have the bed, like, instructions on what to prepare for them. So once I had settled them in, I went for my event. Around midnight that night, I was called. The baby was stooling and vomiting, you know. But the way the matron was panicked. Mm. And they had called the clinic as well. We have the hospital hadn't come. So I, I ran. I drove back to Midland that night mm. myself. I took this child. The back and forth, say eh, we went through that night. Like the private hospital close to us eventually said, "This is beyond them. Take this child to Lasut back." I went back to Lasut after two and a half hours of waiting on the queue in the middle of the night. This was now like two a.m. Mm. This child was passing out. Then the doctor came, looked at the child, started writing something. I thought it was a bed placement. When he finished, there was a note referring me to lose what? at like 2.30 a.m. So I said, he says, this child is really critical. Take to lose. I said, but if he says it's critical, give some sort of first aid. Do something yes. before sending me away with a child that is in this condition. And I said, madam, our beds are full. I said, I don't need a bed. I'll sit on a bench and hold this child. You know, But weren't attended to. Sorry, I'm not trying to give bad publicity. I think they also had a lot of traffic. But I'm just saying my experience. No, it's, 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 not, it's no surprise that the healthcare system in this country is appalling. Jeez. And I don't understand the whole transferring of this and that. It's like these specific hospitals are specialized to handle some cases and not cases. Because I don't own, understand that uh, forever transference. Especially when you see somebody is critical. Yeah. Because you don't want them to die in your in A three your months hands. old baby. <sighs> and I said from an orphanage. So I got the baby back in the car, had my matron with me. I started driving at 2.30 to 3 a.m. And I had to locate Lut in panic. And this child was now sounding like it was his last breath. Because anything that he had stooled and vomited so much that anything you put in his mouth comes out the way it is. So if you give him milk, mm. it brings out, passes out the milk in his milk form from his anus. It was a bad situation. So that's how I found the pediatric hospital I use now. Mm. When I got there at about 4 a.m., the guy, he, he didn't even say, how are you? He looked at the child, took the child from my hand, and ran up and started setting drip lines and mm. things like that. We were on our feet to like 4 p.m. the next day before this child was stabilized. In fact, I missed my master exam, I remember. Before this child was stabilized. So after that, I'm just like, man, I'm not gambling. I found somewhere that works for me. We did a retainer with him. So my kids mm, go there. Okay. Even if I'm out of the country, the kids, once it's from my home, they would attend to the kids. He has a nurse coming in to check on the kids uh, twice a month, things like that. So at times I pay in advance. At times I pay, but there are times when you just realize that you've piled up bills, mm. you know, in the hospital. And it's healthcare, you cannot compromise. <laughs> you so can't. you then begin to find ways of breaking down the bills in a bit. One child can leave the hospital with a bill of 250000 It's It's health. Though, recently, the government is trying to do a health insurance thing for orphanages. They've started the process and, you know, by the time they are done, I hope this helps us a lot. I applaud you. <laughs> I'm not even going to lie. I applaud you. So I, I, I believe that your biggest challenge will be financial constraints and all of that. Basically. Well, maybe someone taking off some of the fees will be great, but it all boils down to finance or yeah. healthcare bills. I hope this pulls through with the insurance the government is doing. I think it will be pretty soon. In a couple of weeks, we may be able to access you know, free healthcare from some private hospitals by the government. But those are like the two biggest things. Um, it's all finance related, not to pretend. Mm. Did you take um, donations apart from financial donations? Like, 
clothing, food, items and all of that? Yeah, we do. Um, for me, I didn't put a big signage on the street saying no signage, come and help my kids. Because I'm also aware that as they are growing and going out daily, you know, there's a stigma that the society places. Mm. So it's basically people that find out about us that reach out and very open, financial. I, what we just don't take is cooked food. Because oh. one has got to be yeah. careful. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, but that would be weird. That would be people bringing cooked food. A lot of people do. A lot of people even get upset when you say, please, we don't accept cooked food. That's just weird. Why are they giving you cooked food? Isn't it easier to just go and buy the bag of rice and the eggs and carrot oil and give it to you? We would prefer that. Yeah. yeah. But some will say, oh, that uh, a prophet said they should cook something and come. I like not for my children. No, I'm no, sorry. No, 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 please, please, please. All right, so do you want to drop your contact details in case anyone wants to reach out to you? Mm, which of them should I drop? Phone number or account details? No, not account details. Phone number, phone email. Number. Okay, email is Paul Foundation at gmail.com jagede paul foundation at gmail.com or you can mail my personal email vnkong at yahoo.com that's the word nkong at yahoo.com and if people want to follow you on social media um um so my company runs the orphanage so to speak qtb events qtaby events qtaby events or me victoria hong kong on all social media victoria hong kong all right so before you go i'm gonna ask you about i'm gonna ask you our right or wrong question okay uh so there's no right answer no wrong answer just your opinion is needed so the question okay. for today is are rich people obligated to engage in some form of philanthropy what do you think i think yes and i can i can portray <laughs> why i think yes all right let's hear you um, so as you example of a project I do called slum invasion mm -hmm. um, I got robbed when I first moved to Lagos in traffic and the, the kids that robbed me I call them kids because these boys were young mm. that robbed me in fact when they when they came to my side mirror I thought they were begging for money to eat mm. so I tried to bring like 200 and I had to give them then I realized that oh they were trying to break my mirror then they say bring everything they were so when I, I couldn't I could have moved my car to jam one of them or something but mm. I was just saying these kids why so that's what birth slum invasion for me. So we then now go to slums. We partner with skill acquisition organizations and they go teach some of them skills, you know, give food. The idea in my head is that the more kids we get out of the slums, the more youth in the slums we empower to look up to themselves as being capable of being better than just mm. stealing and killing. We make the society safer for ourselves. True. You know, because these kids, you live there, that grow up, nobody's turning to them, they don't go to school, what they see is their elder brother raping girls and stealing and blah, blah, blah. They grow mm. up into that. Those mm. are the boys that come tomorrow and rob us and kill us and whatever. So even with your wealth, you owe yourself, now not even society, a responsibility to do, to do the bits that you can to sanitize the environment you live in, to make it safer for yourself. And mm. this is, I'm not even trying to be moral about what God says or or I'm just saying, even for your own good, yeah. the fewer, uh, the monsters we create always come back to haunt us. You see, when they did answers and they say hoodlums, who are hoodlums? Mm. Hoodlums are Nigerians <laughs> like you and I, mm -hmm. who who think that they are, I mean, they are willing to be caught and prosecuted for just stealing a plastic chair. Think about it. If you feel like something good can come out of your life, you won't carry a cutlass and go on the road and match it another person to steal plastic gel or rice or whatever so mm -hmm. the monsters we create will hunt us so why not do your little bit to reduce the number of monsters in the society so that you can enjoy your money happily <laughs> to your law so yes you owe and then furthermore you see there's no manual to life today you're a billionaire tomorrow you don't know what life holds so i always say to myself that mm. you know i don't want to be called wealthy for how much I have. I want to be called wealthy for the number of lives that I've imparted because you know what? These lives, directly or indirectly, I'll benefit from them. I'm building a community of independent people so that the day I'm down, I might be lucky to reach out to one of them who will support me. They might hear a child with my name, oh, is that Victoria? That's the person that gave me my first opportunity. Mm. <laughs> and whatever. So you're building your own support system when you help people. Mm. That's my mantra. So yes, by all means, your money is not for you alone. Use it as a place by cleaning up the streets, by contributing and giving back to society. I like that. I like that. This was such an enlightening, very enjoyable conversation. I liked it a lot today. <laughs>
I'm not even lying and I'm happy that this was my first interview for the year 2021 so thank you so much Victoria for being here with us we appreciate it and we appreciate all that you do and so guys uh, she's given out her contact details so if you want to get involved and you know be a part of giving back to society you should definitely reach out to her because the children are our future and we have to do all that we can for the children in need all right my name is kel this is still kel on sunday on lagos talks 91.3 don't go anywhere the show is not yet over we'll be right back Oh, I enjoyed myself. Sorry. It was so nice. Like, okay. So that's what you do. Um, hey, hey, hey. It's really so that's what you do. This is it. Because me had mentioned it before, but I just never really understood. I'm like, I don't understand. How do you there have 24 children? What are you talking about? What are you saying? How are you saying? Let's take a picture.